Okay, it is 12 o'clock on the dot, so I think we are going to get started. So welcome everybody for joining us for our first webinar series, um, our first portion of this webinar series that's actually being held last because of being rescheduled due to the Nor'easter um, earlier this week. So thank you for, um, for coming back and joining us over the last three days. Um, you know, I hope this finds you well and you're, and you're ready for the weekend. So once again, this webinar series was created and brought to you by the New Hampshire Silver Jackets, and it will highlight the New Hampshire Flood Hazard Handbook, which was the guide that was created by the Silver Jackets team. Um, we'll touch a bit more on, you know, who the Silver Jackets are and that handbook again in just a few minutes. But let's again, just like the last two days, um, briefly go over some housekeeping items before we get started with our presentations. So as a reminder, my name is Katie Pate, and I'm the Flood Plan Management Program Coordinator within the New Hampshire Office of Planning and Development. Um, for housekeeping items, this webinar is going to be or is being recorded, and it will be posted onto the New Hampshire Office of Planning and Development's YouTube page afterwards. Cameras and microphones are turned off for all attendees. Um, there will be time at the end after all the presentations for Q&A, at which um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. I'll be able to unmute you, and then you can ask that question verbally. Um, the chat feature is available, though, throughout the, all the presentations. So if you want to ask your questions or any comments in the chat, please feel free to do that as well as we go along. Um, if you have any technical issues as we go through here, um, please put that in the chat as well if you can, um, and somebody will be able to assist you as soon as possible. So as this is the last webinar of, of the week of the series. I'm sure you're all aware by now, but if you haven't been able to join us the last few days, um, this is part of a larger um, three-part webinar series that's being held um, as part of Flood Safety Awareness Week. Um, the previous two webinars covered the during the flood and after the flood, and then today's topic we'll be covering before the flood. So just a little bit of background about the Silver Jackets. Um, the New Hampshire Silver Jackets is a state-led team that was formed back in 2015, and it brings together state and federal agencies to focus on flood risk management um, issues that do affect local communities in New Hampshire. As you can see by all our logos on the screen, there's quite a few of us um, on the team as well. So here is an overview of our agenda for today. Um, first, we'll briefly cover the New Hampshire Flood Hazard Handbook, just like we have the last few days, just giving some information about what it is, what it contains, and where you can find it. Um, then we will have a series of presentations, which include um, from the National Weather Service, the United States Geological Survey, and then also FEMA. And then afterwards, as I mentioned, we will have some time for Q&A at the end. Okay, so we're going to start again with a quick poll question. It's the same poll questions I've I've asked the last two days, but I know we have different people attending different days, so I want to make sure we um, get everybody's input. So it's going to pop up on your screen in just a second. And that question is, have you seen or are you aware of the New Hampshire Flood Hazard Handbook? And so A, I'm familiar with it and knew of it prior to this webinar series, or you've first heard of it this week, but you hope to utilize it moving forward, or you've never heard of it before today, and today's the first webinar um, that you're joining. So I'll give everybody a minute to submit their answers. It's all anonymous. There's no right or wrong answer. I don't know who put what. Um, it's purely just gauging um, just, just who's here and if you are aware of it. Perfect. It looks like I think almost everybody responded. So I think I'm going to close that poll. So it looks like the majority of people are familiar with it beforehand, but we do have a couple of people who either just heard about it this week or haven't heard of it before today. So either way, um, I think it's a great time to either learn more about it if you already knew, or hopefully you'll be able to learn about it today and then utilize it moving forward as well. So in 2019, the New Hampshire Silver Jackets released the New Hampshire Flood Hazard Handbook for Municipal Officials. This publication is designed to help communities prepare for, respond to, and recover from floods. It includes guidance, best practices, and information about available federal and state resources organized into situation-specific sections. So these three sections are before the flood, during the flood, and after the flood, um, which might sound familiar because this webinar series are, you know, followed those three sections and covers what's included in the handbook. Also included in the handbook is a customizable flood response and recovery checklist that can be used by communities to identify and manage priority actions when a flood does happen. Um, the handbook is also available in a PDF online, but we also have some in print available as well. 
Um, I'll put in the chat um, in just, just a few minutes when I'm done speaking, I'll put the link to the, the, um, the handbook and the customizable um, checklist in the chat. Um, but if you do want a printed copy for your community and you haven't told me already in this webinar series, please feel free to reach out because we do have those printed copies available and would love to um, coordinate to get them to your community. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to um, our representatives from the National Weather Service to begin their presentation. OK, Sarah, I see you're muted, just so you know. Just as I asked if you could hear me OK. <laughs> All right, Perfect. Let's again. Uh, my name is Sarah Jameson. I'm the Senior Service Hydrologist with the Weather Service Office up in Gray, Maine, and we do have uh, service for the entire state of New Hampshire. And joining me here from the Weather Service is from the Northeast Regional Forecast Center based out of Massachusetts, um, Service Coordination Hydrologist Jason Elliott. Go ahead and wave, Jason. <laughs> He'll be, uh, we'll be tag teaming this just a little bit today. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is the National Weather Service flood related products and services. Uh, we know that we have a lot of information that we are pushing out to the public and sometimes it's not always easy to understand exactly what we're trying to say or where to find that information. So we're going to give you kind of a quick rundown on, uh, on what we do with the weather service when it comes to flooding. So um, if you're not overly familiar with what we do, um, our essential mission is the protection of life and property. Um, and we do fall under the federal government. We're under the Department of Commerce and under the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. A weather forecast office, like where I work, which is pictured here, um, there are 122 light offices across the country. As you can see, it's kind of uh, piecemealed, um, the geographic regions and the size of, of our forecast area. Uh, but the gray office does have all of the state of New Hampshire in our forecast area. Okay. All right, and Jason, if you want to chime in on this one. Yep, so the difference between the weather forecast offices and the, and the river forecast centers is a couple different things. One, we cover a larger area and it's based off of river basins delineation. That does, of course, mean that the entire state of New Hampshire is within our service area as well. Uh, our role is to provide and to create river forecasts and to maintain the models that create those river forecasts for all of the streams that we are able to forecast for within our service area. So there are a number of forecast points within the state. We provide that guidance and we pass it off to the weather forecast office to issue the warnings and to get those forecasts out to the public. And we'll talk more about that a little later. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, so when we talk about flooding, as I mentioned, the Weather Service, we issue a lot of products and it can be a little bit confusing. But if we break it down into the core types of flooding, um, there is river flooding, which is really where the River Forecast Center and what Jason and his team do um, to run these sophisticated forecast models and give us estimates and forecasts on how high those rivers are going to get. Uh, then there's overland flooding. This is when there's either rain or rain snow combination where it's so much coming down that it doesn't have time to be channeled through the ditches and the streams and into the rivers and it becomes overland flooding concerns. Uh, most typical when we start to get snow melt or um, when we get into the warm season, we just have those really torrential rainstorms. And then we have coastal flooding, um, which is, you know, even though you have a small coastline, relatively speaking, compared to Maine, you guys certainly do get your share of coastal flooding impact. So there are three basic types of flooding that we at the National Weather Service try to provide uh, forecasts and warnings for. So um, what I'm gonna do is kind of take you through almost like a time step of how we get to um, you know, issuing those flood warnings. We're gonna look at this big picture long-term, and then as we get closer to the event and then break down the type of the warnings that we actually issue. OK, so uh, this slide I actually just changed um, this week, as you guys are very familiar. We just had a snowstorm that really changed um, our uh, spring flood outlook uh, for the region. So what we do um, starting in January is uh, the weather service offices all across the region will basically take a snapshot of what our current conditions are. 
and try to project that over the next two weeks to see, well, what does this do to our flood risk? As we start to see rivers and streams become ice coated, um, as we start to see those snowpacks growing or the opposite, if we start to see significant melt, how is our flood risk um, during this most vulnerable time frame over the winter and the spring season? So these snapshots are issued um, every two weeks from January. But once we get into March, we actually start issuing these on a more frequent basis. We, I, us at the gray office, we issue them every week. Um, so we have the text product, which is on the left, which is a very descriptive breakdown of things like how much water is in the snowpack, how, what's the river ice conditions, what's the soil moisture status. Um, so there's a lot of information in that. But if you want just a quick hit on what is my flood risk, uh, we have a graphical one that we send out to our core partners. And as you can see, this is the one that we put out yesterday. Um, we do have a few basins that are in above average right here in southern New Hampshire, uh, where we got two to three feet of snow. And we have more than two to three feet of snow in other parts of New Hampshire. But what makes that part of the state more vulnerable is the fact that um, they tend to melt at a rap more rapid rate this time of year compared to the higher terrain. Um, just the nature of being further south uh, is, plays into that. So that's why these particular watersheds are a little bit more vulnerable going into the spring thaw than our northern watersheds. Uh, but this information is kind of a precursor or a heads up of what we're seeing as areas that we need to watch. Okay. Then as we get a little bit closer, so that product was issued for about a two week window. Now say we're within four to seven days of a potential flood event. Um, the way that we try to share information is uh, we do have information or forecasts on the amount of precipitation we are expecting and it goes out for seven days. Here is a graphic and I do wanna stipulate none of these three graphics are real time. These are all outdated products. So don't think that this is an actual forecast. Uh, so here's a seven day accumulation of pre uh, precipitation precipitation. So that can give you a heads up, right? If we're looking at a soaking rain event or, or snow event coming up. Um, the River Forecast Center will issue five day significant river flood outlooks. And I believe Jason um, is going to be talking about that later. But again, want to emphasize that this is for significant river flooding. So this doesn't account for minor flooding, if I'm correct there, Jason. And then we have the hazardous weather outlook that we issue. And these products are issued several times a day. And it's, again, a heads up product where um, and it covers all hazards that we might forecast for. There's a chance of a mixed freezing rain coming up or there's a chance for uh, a warm up and a snow melt, in which case the river ice could start to move. So these kind of details are initially introduced through these products. OK, so this is kind of your heads up window. We haven't issued any watches or warnings yet because it's too far out, uh, but we do have concerns or there's you know, the potential of something happening and, the, and our confidence levels are starting to rise. So if we're about two to three days out of a potential flood event and um, given the the large scale nature of it or the high confidence in the melt rainfall, uh, we may issue a flood watch. Uh, I'm, what I want to emphasize with these products is that we do tend to put a lot of information in the text and in the uh, briefing packages that we ship out. Um, so it's probably worth taking the time to look at the details because we may only be expecting an inch of rain, but when you add on to that ice on the rivers, um, snow melt, there are other things that we're going to be addressing in those products. So um, it might be worth actually reading um, what the added text is in these products. Okay, so the flood watch has been out, um, the rain's hitting, the snow melt's happening. Um, now you're going to start seeing flood warnings coming up from the Weather Service. If we think back on December 23rd, where there was, you know, all that rain, snow mix, um, snow melt situation that went on, we had a lot of flooding, a lot of overland floodings that eventually led into river flooding. Um, so that's when we start issuing the warnings. These are very high confidence. It's either ongoing or it will be starting very soon within a matter of hours. Um, and if you click clicked on the actual warnings that we start putting out, that's where you're going to get very specific detail about the time frame of the hazard, what areas are particularly vulnerable. We may be mentioning specific streams or creeks as well. Okay. And again, going back to December 23rd, um, 
we had frozen ground, we have all this rain coming in, a little bit of combination of snow melt, and we had a lot of water, right? It didn't really have anywhere to go. The ground was frozen. Um, so that resulted in a lot of overland flooding. Again, this is not from the rivers coming up. This is rain, snow melt. It just doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, if it's the way we kind of categorize our products, um, if it's fairly nuisance flooding um, or expected to recede pretty quick, not really a threat to life and property, but let's say it, it closes some roads on your morning commute. Well, that's inconvenient and it is an impact, but it's not a threat to your life or to property. So that would be a flood advisory. That's kind of our lower tier flood product. Um, if it starts to become more widespread, more impactful, or that risk level has jumped up where now it's actually starting to get into some properties. Okay, well now this is having damages associated with it. So this is a much higher risk. This will be an aerial flood warning. Um, if it comes, if the flooding happens very quickly within a matter of six hours, that's when we would upgrade this to say a flash flood warning. This is more typical in your warm season when we get that really torrential rainfall. Um, but you can get it in the cold season as well. Again, when the ground can't really absorb because it's frozen. And then we actually have a tier level of our flash flood warnings. If we issue a flash flood warning, you may not have your phone, your cell phones alerting. Uh, but if we issue this tier three or tier four um, to considerable or catastrophic, those levels should trigger your cell phones. And I have it denoted here as a WIA alert. These are basically, this is a serious, serious threat to life and property, a situation where the water might come to you. With a flash flood warning, there are times where it's like, avoid these areas. You know, it's a threat to life and property, avoid the area. With considerable and catastrophic, it may be more about wall of water type of a scenario where it's just a tremendous amount of risk to life and property. These are rarely used but very high level risk factor. So let me just demonstrate this visually, because if you're like me, it's much easier if I can see a visual representation of it. All right, so here's an example. I can't argue that it's not flooding, right? There is visually flooding occurring in these two pictures, but what is the threat level? Not very significant, right? If you just avoid the floodwaters, you'll be fine. It's not impacting properties. It's not causing damage maybe to the lawn, but we don't consider that a high enough impact to issue warnings for an entire community. Aerial flood warnings. Okay, as you can see from these pictures, the threat level has gone up a magnitude, right? We're starting to see um, flooding that is inundating properties. Okay, that's significant. Or we're looking at enough water that if you're driving on that road right there, um, you know, you could be in a lot of trouble. So this is a much bigger concern and over a broad area. So this would be an aerial flood warning. Flash floods. Again, the definition of flash, it happens very rapidly. That often can lead to erosions of roads, um, rapid urban flooding, small streams and creeks coming out of their banks. It is a threat to life and property. I don't wanna discount that when I talked about the considerable and the catastrophic, but um, it is something that can uh, certainly should be taken seriously. Considerable flash flood warnings. If I were to contextualize this from a flood of recent um time here in new hampshire two summers ago uh when we had all that heavy rain in southern new hampshire some of those floods would probably fall into this considerable flash flood warning again it's very rare and extreme um again this is where it's a tremendous volume of water can cause a tremendous threat to life and property i think that picture there on the right um clearly demonstrates the, the magnitude of this kind of flood water so um, that much higher tier of flooding and then we get to catastrophic flash flooding. We will also call this a flash flood emergency. Um, this can often lead to water rescues, a lot of property damage, wall of water. I can't put my finger on an event that would fit this probably apart from Irene. We could probably go and identify some, some really devastated regions from that event and say that would fall into the catastrophic level. Extremely rare uh, for us to issue those. But as far as the Weather Service as a whole, we certainly do issue a number of those. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Jason to talk about the River Flood Program. All right, thanks. I'll, I'll drive the slides for you. All right, great. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing to know about the River Flood Program is that you know, there are, there are gauges all over the state. They are providing either flow or stage levels, stage heights or both. 
But all those numbers mean nothing as far as a flood warning is concerned until we have the thresholds that you see on the screen. And those thresholds are determined by the local office, by the gray office, going out and looking at these sites in person and looking at past events and getting information from those from emergency managers as far as what happened in those past events, what was inundated, what was affected. So th these thresholds, action, minor, moderate, and major, are all set and can be adjusted if they need to be as things change and as new information comes to light. And so this allows us to then put numbers to each of these categories based on the stage. So for example, minor flood might be 10 feet, moderate flood might be 15 feet, major flood might be 20 feet. And then the warnings follow accordingly. So the warning would be issued on a minor flood and then upgraded, still a warning, but upgraded as you go up in category to be more of a, more of a concern and to provide additional information. Um, what the, to go back to Sarah's point from the previous slide, that flood outlook that we issue that goes out five days is, as she said, based on moderate flooding or greater. Uh, next slide, please. So the primary forecast that we issue from the River Forecast Center, which then goes to the gray office and then out on graphics that look just like this, is what we call a deterministic forecast. It's one number or one set of numbers every six hours, in most cases every six hours. At the tidal sites, we issue every hour, but at most of our locations, it's, at, it's every six hours. Um, and it's based off of the various conditions. And these conditions can be different depending on the situation. For example, we've got a rain event, a fairly light rain event, but a light rain event on top of snowpack, on top of snow melt if it gets above freezing, far enough for it to happen. And then you have snow on the backside, potentially, all in, with the system that's coming through this weekend, today and tomorrow. So all those things have to be considered, and you'll be able to see that in the next slide, which will show you how we interact with all of those. I, it'll actually be the one after this uh, that will uh, show you how we interact with all those different elements. To get to our forecasts, um, the website at the bottom left of the screen is a direct link. If you have trouble getting to that specific location, you can go to just water.weather.gov and then click on New Hampshire on the map and it'll take you to this page that's shown on the left-hand side. Um, all those dots are locations that have forecasts. When you hover over one of those dots, you'll get the hydrograph image that's shown at the bottom center of the page here. Um, and you'll be able to see those for each of those individual locations. If you click on the dot, it will take you to a specific page for that specific location where you can see the flood impact statements that are shown on the right side of this slide. Um, these are those same impact statements that the local weather forecast office has gone out and determined based on surveys and talking to locals and talking to the emergency management community about what happens at specific stages, and those numbers were used to determine the action, minor, moderate, and major categories. On the next slide, we'll get to what I promised on the previous slide, which is how we interact with all the information that is out there and how that all plays into the modeling that we do. So this is an example of one point in our river model and all the things that can go into it. The observations obviously are going to play a role because the model's immediately going to try to put what's going on to the current observation. But it's also factoring in the precipitation over the last few days, the snow melt over the last few days, and what's going to happen with both future precipitation and future snow melt. For example, on a day like today, we're getting up to the upper 30s to around 40 degrees. Is anything really going to melt out of that or how much is going to melt out of that? The model may be taking a lot of melt out of the snowpack at that temperature just because it's above freezing. But in reality, there may not be that much that melts because it's not really that warm. And so our forecasters have the ability to go in here and push that melt down to have it have the model do less melt and therefore have less response on the river. You also see here that there are lower zone and upper zone delineations at the top. So we're taking a lot of these mount, more mountainous basins and splitting them between the valley and the higher elevations so that that way, if it's below freezing up top, but it's above freezing down in the valley, we can split that out and not have and be able to manipulate both of those individually rather than trying to put them together. We also factor in all of the things that flow into that stream. So if you have a 
big big river like say the Connecticut River and all the little streams that flow into it, we can take the stream flow from all those small streams, combine them up, and that helps us figure out what the flow should be and what the height should be at that downstream point. And then the next slide is what you ultimately see, which is just that graph. So all the stuff you saw on the previous slide is what we do behind the scenes to make this one picture that you see on the internet. Um, our rainfall forecast and the stream level forecasts that drive them go out 72 hours in the future. For some significant events like an Irene level or something that has a little bit more lead time, we may pull both the rainfall forecast and the stream flow forecast out longer than 72 hours. And then the next slide goes into a new, newer type of thing that we're doing, which is probabilistic forecasts. And these go out 10 days. So our Deterministic forecast, the single number, that one graph goes out three days, but this goes out 10 days and factors in all sorts of different meteorological and hydrological conditions to give you a range of possibilities way out in the future. You can see on this particular image that there's some potential for the Warner River here to get close to flood stage out on day 10. Uh, if, actually, if you looked at the same graphic for today, you would see the same thing. There's a system coming in about eight or nine days, and a lot of the streams could react depending on how warm it is, how much melt there is, how much precipitation there is. And that whole range of possibilities is out there. And it's really, frankly, better than if we were just to try to give you a single number out that far, because we're, we don't really know exactly what's going to happen out that far. But to have this range of possibilities, you can plan what's going to happen or what could happen in that day four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten time frame. And with that, I will pass it back to Sarah. Okay, yes, very timely because that is what we're looking at late in, <laughs> late in the forecast. Um, so I'm gonna transition just a little bit onto coastal flooding, which is not Jason or my expertise so much, but the weather service office that we work for do issue these. Um, here was a picture from the same December 23rd event uh, where we had pretty significant astronomical high tides um, that unfortunately coincided with a pretty significant storm system. It was kind of a, a perfect timing um, for the two elements to come together to produce such significant flooding in this area, which is no stranger. Um, so one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, we struggle with, and I apologize that high astronomical, high astronomical time wrapped around poorly. Uh, but essentially is every time we have a high astronomical time, we are all on guard for any upcoming storm systems because when we're in that situation, we're definitely more primed or more at risk for coastal flooding. Uh, but what happens most of the time, probably 90% of the time, is that we don't get the timing of the storm, the storm surge, the wave run up, and the high, high tide to line up just right. They're, they're usually offset, um, and that's what typically saves us. What happened on December 23rd, unfortunately, is things all just kind of seem to phase at the same moment, and that's why we had uh, a fair amount of coastal flooding. Um, but this is why we really, really struggle going into a coastal flood event, and because it literally for us, it comes down to timing. And if we happen to have that storm come in more at low tide, what was a significant event on December 23rd could be a typical run the mill, just high tide event. Um, so that is the biggest, biggest variable that we always struggle with, with hurricanes, nor'easters, coastal storms. Uh, but knowing when we have astronomical high tides, is really a significant factor in our flood level there. And um, similar to what you've been seeing for our river forecast, we actually have um, tidal gauges that are, um, some are owned by NOAA, some by some other cooperators, um, but we have permission to plot the observations on our page, just like with the rivers. And then we have forecasts that we put out. Um, and similar to our rivers, we have minor, moderate, and major flood stages. Um, again, this doesn't always take into account you know, wave action and that kind of splash over effect because that can very so dramatically um but this is a great place to go it's on our same web page where our river forecast points are you just click on the title gauges and you'll get our forecast and they do account these are forecaster adjusted forecast so this isn't coming straight from a model 
Um, and it will have information there even on impacts that you can expect. So if you're in coastal New Hampshire and you're not aware of this, you might want to uh, explore this and I'm happy to talk about it further. Okay, but since our time is wrapping up here today, I am going to leave it with, um, you know, one of the things that Jason and I really, really try to do effectively is recognize what the potential is of something happening, trying to message it in such a way that decision makers like yourself have enough information to start doing some of the actions as you see in these in these images. And, you know, we can't wait until we're 100 percent sure to let you know, because by then there might not be enough time. So um, we try to do the best we can to keep you informed. But, you know, giving the information from you guys directly really helps us in our decision making too, in our messaging. So um, having these discussions are great. Um, now, you know, my my face and my voice and you've been introduced to Jason. Feel free to reach out to us if uh, you have concerns about any flooding in your community. Um, and again, if you see something and we're not putting it, we don't have a warning out, please let us know, especially if it comes to like ice jams or we can't really identify those. Um, give us a call anytime. This is a private line just for spotter reports, but it'll get you directly in contact with someone in our office and that will be available in the slides. And here is the email address for myself and Jason. So again, any questions that you have on anything that we discussed today or any questions about an upcoming forecast, uh, feel free to shoot us an email. All right. And with that, I believe it, I can pass it over to Rick or if there's any questions at this point. I'm great. I see there is one question in the chat, um, but I think we're going to hold the questions for the end, if that's okay, just so we don't cut into anybody else's time, um, a presentation time, I should say. So we'll, we'll okay. definitely come back to um, the question in the chat. So don't worry. All right. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Katie. Um, my name is Rick Kai. I am the uh, stream gauge and groundwater monitoring program. Um, Chief for the New Hampshire Vermont Office of the New England Water Science Center. And today I'll talk a little bit about stream flow conditions and the USGS uh, flood response. All right, today I'm going to cover these particular items and quickly go over some of the stream gauging network. Um, we have a, a network of about 60 stream gauges that we monitor in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, some of these have been around for over 100 years. Um, and it's the backbone of some of most of the work that we'll be talking about today. Uh, along with collecting the data, it's important that we analyze uh, for trends and uh, provide context to some of the data that we are collecting. Uh, that's an important role of USGS uh, following floods in particular. Um, along with the stream gauge network, we have ancillary data sets that we collect, uh, particularly high water marks following a flood. We'll talk about some of the data that we've collected there. Uh, and some of that is used uh, to help construct inundation maps. And, and USGS is in the process of upgrading our uh, natural water information system. And I'll talk about some of the new products that we have. Okay, I would be remiss uh, when we start talking about stream flow conditions not to recognize some of our state, local, and federal partners uh, that help con to contribute to uh, maintaining the stream gauge network. In particular, I want to say uh, thank you to the Army Corps of Engineers and the Hampshire DES. Uh, City of Keene, Rochester, Town of Salem, uh, Nashua, and some of the private uh, hydro facilities who contribute to uh, the upkeep and operation of our network. All right, and Sarah and Jason earlier mentioned uh, antecedent conditions and, and the role that they play in uh, flood preparedness and flood um, uh, potential flood impacts. Um, Thinking about just this week, we had a significant amount of snowfall in New Hampshire. Uh, there's quite a bit of snow water equivalent there. Um, and so the that base uh, water equivalent uh, with the additional precip could lead to you know, pre uh, significant flooding. Uh, USGS has a uh, product water watch uh, that is designed to be a graphical interface and allow users to uh, look at past and current conditions in, in each of our uh, each state in the country. Uh, here, uh, this product here, the two graphs of the uh, last 45 day uh, summaries for New Hampshire. The upper graph shows uh, average stream flow index 
uh, for 29 strain gauges in the state of New Hampshire that have long term systematic record. Uh, you can see in January and February conditions were above that normal line. Uh, and then through March, we dropped back into that normal range. And the bottom plot is again, it shows those 20, the 29 stream gauges as a percentage that fall within each of the percentiles with the bluer and the colder colors being higher conditions and the, and the hotter colors being normal conditions or below normal conditions and the green being normal. And again, uh, as of Sunday, uh, conditions across New Hampshire were normal. Um, shown there in the map, showing everything green. Uh, more recently, we've uh, started to see some of that uh, recent snow uh, melting off and some precip in, in, on Tuesday. The seacoast area of New Hampshire has actually jumped up into the above normal range again. Uh, the, again, this product in the graph in the middle it comes from Water Watch and it is a, shows a seven day average stream flow for the Warner River uh, for 2022 and 2023. Uh, the black line there is a seven day average and you can see last January uh, conditions were typically normal and then in February and March we had an earlier runoff than uh, than usual and uh, conditions went up into the above normal range and then receded down through September uh, into much below normal conditions. Uh, this particular uh, December, if you recall, uh, Christmas Eve we had a significant rain event we had some significant high water across the state. The Warner River went up into the much above normal range and has been staying above normal for most of January into February, and then recently jumping down into that normal range. Now, along with collecting that uh, historic, uh, all our historic data at our stream gauges, um, it's important for us to analyze for trends and estimate the flood probabilities that there are stream gauges. It helps us understand and provide context to our, uh, each of the floods that we have experienced. And I'm sure many of us have, have seen this question, you know, didn't we just have a 100 year flood? Um, and it's important when we think about the 100 year flood or the recurrence interval of a 100 year flood. Um, there's another way we can look at it. We can look at it as a, a matter of chance. Uh, looking at it as an annual exceedance probability. So that 1% annual exceedance probability it correlates to the 100 year recurrence interval. So there's a one in 100 chance on any particular year that we will hit that 1% annual exceedance probability. So I think that's a key point when uh, we're analyzing these for long term trends is that a 100 year flood you know, has a 1% chance in any given year that that may occur. And if we put that in context of a, of a mortgage, if a home is built within the floodplain of the 100 year flood, uh, over the course of that 30 year mortgage, there's a 26% chance that that flood, uh, flood uh, that house will be flooded, um, which is pretty significant. And I think it, it is key to the, to the need for proper floodplain management. And here we show uh, some screen captures of some uh, fun, uh, some recent studies on on recurrence intervals that, that were done at stream gauges across New Hampshire. Um, another way to look at this, uh, you know, to help visualize that 1% or the, the statistics related to the annual exceedance probabilities. Here's a, a, a screen capture of the Pemigewasset River at Plymouth. Uh, here we have the, the annual peak discharges for the period of record. This is the Pemigewasset River at Plymouth was the first stream gauge established by USGS back in 1903. We have over 119 years, we're on 119 years of record at this site. Uh, so here we have of those peaks, if you just think the 1% uh, annual exceedance probability is about a six, 60,000 CFS. So over the course of those 119 years, we've had two peaks uh, reach that level, which seems uh, realistic, right? And as we work our way down, we get the 10% annual exceedance probability of so the 10 year recurrence interval, it's so about 35,000 CFS, and then work down all the way to the bottom of that 50% AEP, or that's a two year recurrence interval, where you expect half of the half of the annual peaks to be above or below. Now, if we switch that over and, and put this into context with the National Weather Service flood categories and the flood impacts, from their statements that uh, Jason was showing earlier, um, the major flood stage at Pemigewasset at Plymouth is 21 feet. It's about 41,000 CFS shown here in the, in the purple line, and you can see there's about you know 11, 12 peaks above that. 
that we've experienced over the, over the years. And moving down to the moderate flood stage at 18 feet, that's about 32,000 CFS. Uh, and that falls between that 10 year um, and five year event. Um, and then finally the flood stage, that 13 foot or 20, just under 20,000 CFS, uh, that, that falls down below the 50% the AAP or you know, every a two year recurrence interval. So on a two year, every other year or a 50% chance on any given year that waters will reach that um, fire low end flooding and uh, entering the parking lot at the Plymouth State University Ice Arena. Okay, along with documenting, uh, one of the major roles of USGS is to document the, the geographic distribution, and we do that through the stream gauging network. Uh, here's a screen capture from a, a tropical storm Irene. Uh, the map shows um, precip, cumulative precip for the for the event, and then each of the circles is a representative of a stream gauge that reached at least the 4% AEP, the 25% uh, 25 year recurrence interval. So we had 186 gauges from Maryland to Maine that reached that threshold. Uh, the size of the circle uh, indicates the magnitude of the flooding. So the, the larger the dot, the, the higher the, uh, the recurrence interval with the largest dot being a 500 year recurrence interval. You can see here in the White Mountains, we had three stations, the Saco River, in Conway, the East Branch Pemi in Lincoln, and the Pemi Jawasset at Woodstock all reached that 100 year recurrence interval of the 1% AEP. And an important concept I wanted to introduce here when we're talking about um, geographic distribution is the idea of peak attenuation. You notice that the Pemi Jawasset River is downstream of uh, Woodstock, uh, Pemi Jawasset at Plymouth, and the Plymouth gauge is about three times the size of the drainage area of Woodstock, yet the peak was only uh, 40,000 CFS at Woodstock for Irene, whereas uh, at Plymouth, whereas Woodstock was up at uh, 54,000 CFS. So the peak attenuation of the flood plains, uh, moderating the, that flood discharge that, as it went downstream, um, led to a, a less magnitude peak downstream. Preserving high water mark data. So, Typically, after a, a federal disaster declaration, FEMA will reach out to USGS to document high water marks uh, and flood impacted areas. Um, this information is critical um, when we, we start evaluating hydrologic models uh, used for flood inundation maps, used for the flood insurance rate maps, you know, flood warning systems. It's basically it's an answer to the test, right? That we if we go out and document the extent of the high water. Uh, following the events, we have a stream gauge network where we know what the discharge is. We can put the two in together within our hydrologic models and and, and basically fine tune and get a more precise model for future work. Um, it's also a pretty powerful uh, public education tool. Uh, in 2011, 10 years after Irene, it, it selects stream gauges around New Hampshire and Vermont. We established uh, high water mark signs uh, annotating the, the high water. Uh, here the upper photo here shows the Pemi, uh, East Branch Pemi Jawasset at Lincoln and the extent of the high water at that location. Okay, the data from, from these high water marks and such are stored within our flood event mapper. This is a short term network database that USGS maintains. The triangles here shown are, are the high water marks that were obtained following Tropical Storm Irene. We've got over a thousand high water marks in Maine, uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Um, and this data, of course, as I said, we it can use directly to help fine tune the sizing of bridges and the hydraulic models. Uh, we also were in touch with the New Hampshire, uh, the Dam Bureau and New Hampshire DES prior to the event. Um, and they identified two locations where they were looking for supplemental data. They were looking for uh, real time data to help manage these structures. Uh, one over in Milton and one over um, uh, right at the border of Gosstown and Merrimack in uh, Manchester. And so USGS went in and, and established rapid deployment gauges where we were able to broadcast in real time 15 minute stage data for these sites to, for, the, for the state to be able to manage. Uh, of course, the, the, I really missed these sites, but it would, you know, low preparedness, 
uh, getting the infrastructure in place to, to answer the questions that we needed at the time uh, was a critical component to that response. Um, USGS also maintains a surge wave and tied hydrodynamic network across the eastern seaboard uh, prior to nor'easters or high, uh, higher hurricanes or tropical storms will establish uh, short term uh, networks uh, logging on a 30 second or less interval the height of the surge, the tide surge, storm waves, and uh, looking at um, that storm surge as it moves, propagates inland from the coast. And again, it's, a, it's collecting data that's the answer to the test for uh, evaluating our models and helping to fine tune and get more precise models going forward. So hopefully you know, the, the effort to get these in place will help uh, with future forecasting. And again, this is all publicly available within our, our short term network uh, flood event mapper. USGS, we've also, uh, following the, the evolution of uh, the Sun Cook River years ago, uh, we created a flood inundation mapper of the Sun Cook River. Uh, of this mapper, these flood inundation mappers are a series of static uh, model flood results. Um, and, and this one is in particular is key to the uh, Sun Cook River at North Chichester stream gauge. Uh, so when the Weather Service puts out a forecast, we can take this uh, in the, in the uh, pop up window. You can see the bar from seven feet, which is um, a minor flooding to 18 feet, which is major flooding. You can slide the bar up and down here. I have it set at 16 feet and then it will in, it'll uh, show uh, the estimates of the flood boundaries of the river. Uh, here in along in Allenstown, you can see uh, if you click on the inundated area, the blue, uh, it'll give you an estimate of the depth of the water at that particular location. Uh, so here along Buck Street, it's suggesting that uh, half a foot to a foot and a half of water may be there at a at a stage at 16 feet forecast and in, in, uh, at the Chichester stream gauge. So again, this is a, a great tool for emergency management personnel to help uh, uh, with evaluating how to get emergency response vehicles around uh, the floodwaters at the time of the event. Uh, and also with the forecast, it may be able to target uh, resources to, to inform the public that, of potential danger. All right, uh, USGS, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of upgrading our infrastructure, in particular our national water information system. A new tool that we've created is a national water dashboard. Uh, it's a one stop shopping location for all of our real time data uh, from surface water and groundwater levels, spring levels uh, to water quality, precip and atmospheric conditions. Uh, any, any of the, our real time data networks are can, you can display in this graphical interface. And again, it uses the percentiles to color code each of the locations. Um, based on the real time data. A great feature of this tool is it allows you to project uh, weather conditions as well. Uh, so you can put in the most recent one hour radar loop and have it as a static or on, on loop to see how the, the weather pattern is moving through the through the area and how, what impact it is having on the, on the, on the networks. The USGS also has uh, something called water alert. Hopefully uh, people are familiar with this. This has been around for a while. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an app that allows you to go in and, and set uh, thresholds for certain conditions at particular stream gauges, and then you'll be contacted uh, by text or email when that threshold is reached. Uh, you, can, you can access water alert through the water dashboard by selecting a particular stream gauge, and then in, along the uh, upper taskbar, you can select a water alert and it will go to uh, the different parameters that are available for setting uh, thresholds within that site and put in your put in your threshold and, and then start receiving messages. And finally, uh, talk a little bit about our new monitoring location pages as part of that NWIS upgrade. Uh, so each of our uh, each of our stream gauge locations has the, a monitoring location page. Uh, it has the real time data for the last seven days uh, by default. It also has a series of metadata associated with that stream gauge for easy access. Uh, a new feature with this that is uh, pretty popular is this uh, 
a sliding bar that allows you to go through the graph and, and see the uh, the uh, text of or a text version of that data. Um, you can also get to the legacy for now uh, format of the NOS web uh, where you can get the statistics and other uh, historical data. Um, but eventually all everything is going to be pull, pulled over to our new locations page um, and this uh, I would like to uh, ask that if anyone out there, any of your users, if there's something that's not being met by these upgrades, if you could just reach out to me and I can get you in touch with the the uh, developers and uh, and hopefully you can get some positive feedback for the end user on 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 these new tools. So with that, I'll say thank you. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me at, uh, at the email listed. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, I think it's now time. We're gonna move on to our final presentation, which is by Colleen Bailey from FEMA. Hello, everybody. Can you guys see my screen? Everybody sees what I see. Uh, well, uh, now we see, yes, yes, we see your slide. Good, 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 good. fabulous. Okay, so um, I want to introduce myself for those who don't know me. Um, I, my name is Colleen Bailey, and I'm a project manager in the FEMA Region 1 office here in Boston. Um, I'm in the risk analysis branch. Uh, I basically do floodplain mapping, but I really I manage a lot of the projects of our uh, floodplain mapping projects. And so um, that is what I do. And pretty much what I have been doing, although I've worked at like state level and private yeah, industry um, about 20 years or so. And um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about some of the cool tools uh, that FEMA has uh, for state and local officials. Um, and I'm going to talk about two different types of tools. The first set of tools are going to be FEMA's national headquarters tools. Um, these are ones that are developed and maintained down at FEMA headquarters in DC. Um, and then the last couple of tools I'm going to talk about are uh, some tools that we have developed here at the FEMA Region 1 office and that we also maintain. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the FEMA Map Service Center. A lot of people know about this one. It's probably the most well-known. Um, it's kind of a one-stop shop sort of place to go get all of your flood, flood mapping needs. Um, you can get access to the current effective maps. Um, you can get, if you have preliminary maps, you can get those. If you have historic maps, you know, say from the 70s, they're stored there as well. Those are always fun to look at. Um, any letters of map change, whether that's a letter of map revision, uh, like a larger scale revision or a letter of map amendment where somebody just had their home removed. Um, another uh, thing that you can get is you can get some flood risk product data. Not every community has them. I think uh, currently they're only in Rockingham and Stratford County, but um, but basically these tools augment the regulatory products uh, to help the community kind of better understand the risk. And, and they're non-regulatory products, those in particular, um, but they are really good when it comes to kind of planning and mitigation purposes. Um, I, I really like the Map Service Center website. I'm on it probably every day of my life um, and uh, because it, it is so comprehensive. Uh, you can search, you know, if you have a particular address you're interested in, you can type that in. Or if you wanna know what all of the products you can find for a specific community, um, you can do drop down menu, state, county, community. And so um, it's fairly user friendly. And like I said, I use it every day. Um, something that kind of supplements that is the FEMA National Flood Hazard Layer Viewer. Uh, this is kind of basically all your flood maps, but in digital form using a GIS um, uh, sort of platform. And one cool thing about it is if you can use Google Maps, you can use this. It's um, it's really easy to use, search by an address. Um, I would say there's two drawbacks. Sometimes it's really slow to load, like yesterday, just like was taking probably like 10 minutes for it to load. Um, it's a lot of data in one spot. And so um, I always say like try to hit up hit it up early in the morning or later in the evening. Um, but it's also only for communities that have digital data. So if you still have paper-based maps, um, which I think it's only Belknap County, now there's maybe a few communities here and there that are still paper based, but don't worry, Bell Map, Bell Maps on the we're don't worry, we're getting there. We're going to be getting digital maps there shortly. Um, but but if you have digital data, this is where you can view it and look at it. I I use this probably every day as well. <laughs> um, 
lastly, we have the FEMA preliminary uh, flood map changes viewer. Um, and this would be really useful only if you have preliminary maps. If you don't have them out right now, then this wouldn't help you at all. But when you do get them, this is a really neat tool because um, they are, because they're preliminary maps, they're for guidance only. They're not for regulation quite yet. Um, but in this tool, you can use um, something called the preliminary uh, changes since last firm layer, which it, is really cool because you can kind of compare them to the effective firms. And I think that's really neat because it kind of can tell you the spatial extent of where the floodplain, um, they will be changing, uh, whether they're increasing or decreasing. Um, but again, this is kind of one of those things um, that sort of, you can always see the preliminary flood maps here, but you would only be able to use the changes since last firm if you had previous digital data. So um, we are heading into a world where everybody's going to have it. Everybody's going to, you know, be on second, third iterations over time. Um, and so this is, um, I, I, I like this tool a lot uh, too, and I have found it is very useful um, when communities need to go to their um, their officials and say, here's what the maps are going to look like, and here's where they've changed. And it's a really good uh, visual representation of that. Um, lastly. Uh, this is the FEMA flood hazard and risk data viewer. Um, this is this is an interesting one. FEMA headquarters is kind of really pushing this one, and it's really a single location to get all of the data um, that that represents uh, both the current and some future flood conditions. So some of this data is regulatory, and some of it is not. And this viewer um, it shows a variety of flood hazard and risk data. So some of it um, is like depending data, which is maybe after preliminary, but before it goes effective, when you're in that last six month compliance period, you're trying to get those maps adopted at the local level. Um, and uh, it, it does provide, like I said, effective data, which is the, the regulatory products, so that preliminary data, any kind of pending data. Um, it also has sea level rise data, which is really interesting. So it's to me, it's a little bit overwhelming, to be honest, um, but there is a map tutorial here in the upper right corner, and I definitely recommend taking a look at that, go through it. You know, any one of these national tools that we have, you can't break them. Go in and play, you know, check out your community, check out your state, check out whatever um, areas you want to look at, your own home. <laughs> That's what I do. Um, and lastly, I'm going to talk about two tools um, that we maintain here at the FEMA Region 1 office. Um, and the first one is, um, it's it's kind of a newer tool. It's our Coastal Erosion Hazard Map. And by the way, both of these tools are for our folks on the coastline. Um, and this one in particular is a really interesting tool that displays the potential, I have to emphasize that, extent of coastal erosion uh, in 2030, 2050, and 2100. And, and what I mean by that is this isn't showing necessarily where exactly, we know exactly where the erosion is going to be, but these are the areas that have the highest uh, chance of erosion leading up to those years. And they do take into um, affect the impacts of future sea level rise. And um, again, this is not a regulatory product at all. Um, but it is a really useful mitigation tool. And um, um, by the way, Katie's going to provide the links to all of these for you. So if you don't have access to them, um, she will provide them. And last but not least, and I wouldn't say it's our most controversial tool, but it is one that is probably the most difficult to, for a lot of people to understand. The uh, Region 1 LIMWA viewer. And that's a fancy acronym for the Limit of Moderate Wave Action. This, while also a supplemental tool, uh, again, not regulatory um, and only for coastal communities, um, it what it's going to show you is areas of A zones in which are basically anywhere between one and a half to three foot of wave action. So uh, VE zones, which you can barely kind of see on the map here, um, out over the open water and right directly on the coastline. Um, that's Those are areas where the 1% annual chance flood occurs, but it includes three foot of wave action or more on top of the still water elevation because it's directly in proximate proximity to the ocean, of course. <laughs> Um, as the water and the waves kind of move inland a little more, they interact with the land. And uh, because of that friction, um, we start to lose that the, those waves and the waves drop down below the three feet of, of, of wave action that occur out in the VE zones. But what they found over time, they did a lot of studies on this and they found that still quite a lot of damage can happen anywhere between about a foot and a half and three feet uh, of waves. And 
Um, of course, when you're talking regulations, you're only required to build um, to V zone standards in the V zones. What we are hoping that this line or this area will kind of promote is the idea that, hey, look, in this section on the map, probably if you're going to be uh, building here, you might want to build to VE zone standards. It is non-regulatory. You cannot make anybody do that. Um, but it is a good tool to say, you know what, you may get a lot of damage from a big coastal storm here. Um, you're not required to do it, but hey, mitigation, let's save our, our properties and and save our homes, you know, essentially. With so that would be the last viewer we have. Uh, and I say questions, but this is because if you have any questions when you're using the tool, we'll get to other questions here in a minute, but um, if you have any questions that arise when you're actually using the tools. So because we don't um, um, maintain those national tools, I say call the FEMA map information exchange. I worked there 20 years ago um, at 877 FEMA map. Uh, 336-2627, or you can email them. Um, that's if you have any issues with it or, you know, um, uh, difficulties uh, with the, the products. Um, but if it's anything to do with the co two coastal tools, you can always contact me or our geospatial analyst Carl Anderson here in the FEMA Region 1 office, and um, we'd be happy to help you with those coastal tools. And with that, I am finished, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. I'm going to take control back. Um, so this actually leads to the end of all of our presentations for the day. Um, and so now we're moving on to our questions portion. Um, so I know we have one question that we're going to answer first, but just as we go along, if anybody attendee here wants to ask a question, they can raise their hand and then I can unmute them. Or you, if you have any other questions, you can put them in the chat and we can just read them out loud. Um, so we have a question from after um, Sarah and Jason's presentation. I don't know if you guys saw it in the chat, but I'll read it for those who haven't seen it. Um, the question and comment is, it says, I love Noah's ERO. Do you love it? It is frustrating when tours three-day outlook doesn't come to pass into the one day, but I guess conditions change. I trust that the ERO takes some info as the same seven-day accumulated pre precip data. Also, is the ERO impacted by snowpack conditions? Okay, well, first off, um, thank you, Ed. Great question. And for those who aren't familiar, the ERO is the excessive rainfall forecast. Um, so think of this as kind of like if you're familiar with the Storm Prediction Center and their concerns for tornadoes and severe weather coming up a few days out, they'll draw um, an area on the national map that basically it's got a marginal, uh, moderate or high risk of having in this case, excessive rainfall, aka potential for flash flooding or overland flooding. Um, for the question about does it take into account snow, unfortunately, it does not. Um, unfortunately, too much of uh, our agency relies on the ground not being frozen and there not being snow. Uh, but obviously, if we have snow and they're concerned about excessive rainfall, um, you know that's something we should be concerned. Um, and let me go back to your question here to make sure I'm not missing a detail. Uh, oh, it's frustrating when it doesn't come to pass. Yes, and in this field, unfortunately, um, we'll see signals, potential significant rainfalls that for one reason or another, timing, phasing, things just don't come together and um, we don't get um, the expected rainfall. Um, again, these products are very broad brushed, not like our watches and warnings, and they're just to draw your attention to potential risk areas. Uh, for example, last um, the last week, essentially out in California with all that uh, atmospheric river and all that rain on snow and all the flooding in the valleys, that's an area that's been was highlighted for several days. Um, so typically up here in New England, if they're going to be for probably just going to be for uh, slight risk. Uh, it usually takes something like a tremendous um, uh, system with a lot of rain or snow melt or a tropical system for us to get something like a moderate or a high. Those are reserved for very significant widespread events. Um, and let me see if there was anything else. And yes, the, your question about does the excessive rainfall 
outlook take the same information as a seven day precipitation. Um, in fact, it's actually produced by those same forecasters and th those forecasters are not located with me and Jason. Uh, they're actually located at the national center. So this is at the weather prediction center and they're looking at the entire country and they're just drawing, um, like I said, basically points of highest concern um, throughout the next few days on flood risk. So that again, and I apologize, I actually did not include that in this talk, um, but that is another one of those heads up products that uh, the Weather Service issues to kind of let people know and draw your attention to things that we should be paying attention to. Um, doesn't mean it's going to flood, but, you know, we might want to start paying attention and see, see what's going on. I hope that answered your question, Ed. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, we, we feel free to enter if you have any as I follow up here, but um, it looks like that might be it. So as next steps, this is actually the last webinar of this series. So thank you for all who have joined us all three days this week. Um, again, we will be posting these online, the recordings. I'll also be sending up a follow-up email with the slides from each of the webinar, any related um, links, as well as the, the links to the recordings as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that, hopefully in the next week, once we get those up online. Again, please check out the Flood Hazard Handbook if you have not already. Um, I think it's a really great resource that we all worked, not me, I, I didn't personally work on it, but the team worked really hard on it and um, we hope you utilize and enjoy it as much as we do and thank you again any other follow-up questions comments um, you feel free to send it to me um, it, you know um, by email on the screen and I can if it's for me I can answer it if not I'm more than happy to forward that question or, or comment to the appropriate person thank you and I see Ed was just asking how I pronounce my last name and my last name is pronounced Pate P-A-I kind of like you ate something but with a P you paid it <laughs> Perfect. OK, well, I'm going to um, just finish us off with one more poll. It's the same one. Um, if you could just rate this webinar on a scale of one to five. Again, no wrong answers. I don't see what you rated, but it really does help us in our future trainings. Um, so any feedback you can give through that would be much appreciated. And if not, I hope you all have a great weekend. Um, we survived the week. We survived the snowstorm. And I look forward to speaking with you all soon in the future. Thank you, Kay, for putting this all together. No problem. Looks like we have our answer, so I'm going to close the poll and end the webinar. Thank you.